Welcome to Virology 1 in MIC 220. Thank you for attending this uh, online recording uh, while I'm away. So I thought I'd talk about the entire lecture even though we've been through about half the lecture. So if you don't want to watch the first part of the lecture then feel free to fast forward until we start talking about uh, genome replication. So remember, viruses come in different shapes and sizes. So Zika virus has been in the news recently. Measles virus also been in the news uh, at Disneyland. Uh, here's Ebola, which is a very scary, these are called the hot zone viruses. These are filamentous viruses or belong to the Phyloviridae family. Other viruses, in, in addition to Zika, that belongs to the Flaviviridae family are West Nile virus. So uh, the viruses are, are always around us and in the news. As a matter of fact, uh, viruses are uh, more ubiquitous than bacteria. And bacteria, as you know, are everywhere. So I won't go through the objectives because you can read the objectives yourself and if you like I think you can stop the uh, recording and read the objectives. So we already know that all known life forms including bacteria can be infected by viruses. Uh, 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 viruses that infect bacteriophage, excuse me, Viruses that infect bacteria are called bacteriophages. Uh, viruses uh, can uh, generate pandemics. For example, influenza is a worldwide problem every year. It starts out in our summertime, but in the wintertime in Australia, which is where they get, the CDC gets their formulations for the next vaccine for H9N1, for example. And we'll talk about influenza uh, next week. AIDS is another pandemic, right? So uh, we don't worry too much about AIDS, but in the uh, early to uh, early 80s to probably the end of the 1990s, AIDS was a big, big problem. And now we've we've it's still a big problem, uh, but it's a it's turned into kind of a chronic disease, even though lots of people still die of AIDS. But it is a, a pandemic virus. Um, also, uh, your book mentions uh, viruses uh, filling essential niches in the environment, particularly in marine ecosystems. And the example that your book uses is uh, uh, these uh, algae blooms that occur in bodies of water. I think it's red algae, as a matter of fact, that uh, has a particular toxin that kills fish. And if it weren't for a virus that comes and kills the, the algae bloom, uh, the uh, and the algae bloom would, would kind of take over and kill lots of fish. So viruses are important, uh, even though in this medical portion of the course we're going to be talking about viruses as a threat to human health. Uh, so in research we use viruses. We can take them apart and put them back together. We can use uh, certain components of viruses like reverse transcriptase to take um, RNA to DNA uh, and then um, other uh, components of viruses to transduce cells uh, uh, if we want a particular protein uh, uh, made in a cell type. So this is mainly laboratory research. <clears throat> so what is a virus? A virus is a non-cellular particle that infects and reproduces in a host cell. Okay, so the host cell, remember, can be a bacteria, or in the case of a bacteriophage, which is the virus that infects bacteria, or uh, the host cell can be one of, one of your cells, one of, one of our cells, like for example, a respiratory epithelial cell, which influenza infects. Okay, but a virus, even though we, sh we show that, you know, a round virus or, a, or an elongated virus, they're not cells. A virus is a non-cellular particle. Uh, and what the virus does is it takes over or subverts, so uh, it takes over the cell's machinery and produces more of itself. So viral progeny means it produces more of itself. Uh, we call virus particles virions, 
and virions have, for the purposes of this course, virions contain DNA or RNA, sometimes double-stranded DNA, sometimes single-stranded DNA, sometimes single-stranded RNA of positive and negative sense, so negative sense would also be anti-sense, uh, and, and uh, uh, rarely do they contain a hybrid of RNA and DNA. Uh, sometimes there's a little bit of RNA leader on a DNA in hepatitis B viruses, but we're not even going to discuss hepatitis B viruses. We will discuss hepatitis A virus, however. So, so viruses have nucleic acid contained within a protective protein capsid. So a capsid is what protects the nucleic acid. Otherwise, nucleases and, and things that digest DNA and RNA and, and nucleic acid would destroy viral nucleic acid if they weren't protected by this capsid or protein coat. And we'll talk about how capsids assemble here shortly. So host ranges of virus can be very broad. I mean, West Nile virus, for example, infects uh, uh, mosquitoes, birds, birds are also a vector, and humans. So that's a very broad range. Mosquitoes, birds, and humans is a pretty broad host range, but HIV only infects people, causes disease in people. It will also infect chimpanzees, but it doesn't cause the same disease in chimpanzees that it does in chimps. <clears throat> so viruses propagate their genomes. That's the job of a virus, is to propagate its genome. Uh, so, uh, natural biological viruses came along long before computer viruses, but computer viruses are a nice way to illustrate exactly what's going on here. So, uh, in the case of a computer virus, it, somebody makes a computer virus, it comes in and infects uh, a computer, and then you send out emails, and then it infects uh, other computers. So, so the the computer virus just makes more of itself. And that's exactly what a biological virus does, is it wants to make more of itself. And the instructions, uh, unlike zeros and ones for a computer virus, the instructions for a biological virus are obviously nucleic acid, which remember can either be DNA or RNA. Uh, so let's see here. So the, the uh, the interesting thing that I should mention here is that, remember, naked nucleic acid doesn't necessarily infect host cells. Uh, what happens is uh, this nucleic acid here uh, is, is surrounded by a coat, a capsid coat, and, and there are viral receptors on that capsid coat that we'll talk about shortly, and those viral receptors bind to a host cell receptor, and that's how the virus gets inside of a cell. So we'll talk about the steps that the virus uses to get inside the cell here shortly. Okay, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about virus structure now. I'm going to move quickly through these slides because um, it's, it's easy to appreciate all the different shapes and sizes. Some of them look like a lunar lander. Some of them look like uh, our bullet shape, like rabies virus. Some of them are filamentous, so there's a filamentous bacteriophage uh, called M13 that looks similar to filovirus, the Ebola type virus, uh, but it's not, so here's Ebola, a little bit bigger. Uh, Vaccinia virus is one of the largest viruses, although there's been other discoveries of larger viruses. Here's E. coli, so there's about, you can probably fit maybe 20 or so Vaccinia viruses inside of an E. coli, even though Vaccinia virus does not infect E. coli. And here's a red blood cell. So this gives you an idea of how big uh, uh, and how small, how big our cells are and how small viruses are. Here's, here's a polio virus. Polio virus was a problem uh, back in the 1950s. Look how small that virus is compared to E. coli. And remember, E. coli, you need a uh, probably oil immersion on a microscope to see. So once again, different sizes and shapes of the virus. Some of these look like um, satellites, the Sputnik satellite, which was the first to orbit uh, Earth. Uh, so, uh, lots of different shapes and sizes of viruses. So the, the structure of viruses, uh, we'll start in the middle here with a capsid. So remember the capsid surrounds and protects the nucleic acid. Uh, and, and proteins generally uh, uh, compose the capsid. So uh, 
the virus, the genetic material of the virus, encodes the proteins, and those are usually repeated subunits. Okay, so uh, I'll show you a picture of polio here, a slide of polio here shortly, where we'll uh, see how the, the protein subunits assemble into a capsid. And viruses have to have repeating subunits because the genomes of viruses aren't very big. So you saw how small that polio virus was. Well, it can't have a very big genome because it's, it's such a small uh, viral particle. So uh, many viruses have envelopes, and envelopes are composed of whatever the virus budded from. So if the virus replicates in the nucleus and buds from the nuclear envelope, it's going to have a uh, composed of an envelope from the nucleus. Uh, if it buds from the cytoplasm or the cell, the uh, the uh, from the cell membrane, it's going to have a uh, an envelope that is composed of the cell membrane plus other viral proteins. And and I'll show you examples of that shortly. Uh, so many viruses are non-enveloped, and in, in that case, usually the virus doesn't bud; it just kind of bursts from the cell. So this the virus assembles, the genome goes inside the virus, and then this and then the uh, uh, this, there's so much virus there that the cell just bursts and then the viruses are free to infect other cells. Okay, so there's, uh, don't worry about the symmetry and asymm asymmetrical viruses. Uh, you can see that on, on other, other slides. So, so here's the example of self-assembly of viral proteins. So here's the green here is a viral RNA and viruses need to make more of themselves. So not only do they need to make more of their viral RNA, or DNA, as it were, if a virus is composed of DNA, uh, it needs to make its protein capsid. So these are the proteins from poliovirus that compose the protein capsid. And you can see these host cell ribosomes are, uh, are translating the viral nucleic acid just as if this were a cellular messenger RNA. So polio happens to have a positive sense, just like a cellular RNA, positive sense uh, genome, and host cell ribosomes can just hop on this and start translating just as if it were a cellular RNA. Uh, so, and when they start translating, they start making viral proteins because the RNA has the instructions for viral proteins. And you can see that these uh, different colored uh, uh, pentagons uh, self-assemble. So here's viral protein 1, 2, and 3, and they self-assemble into these structures, and then these structures themselves can self-assemble into a capsid, and then there's a little kind of VP4 door on the, on the capsid that opens up, allows the genome to come in, and then closes, seals up, and then we have a capsid with a genome inside, and that would be, for polio, a positive sense RNA. Okay, so here's another example of uh, an icosahedral virus. This is a herpes virus here. So there's uh, glycoprotein spikes in yellow outside, and then there's something called a tegument, which is uh, somewhat unique to herpes viruses. But here's the capsid inside that is uh, protecting the, uh, the nucleic acid. And in the case of herpes, the nucleic acid is a double-stranded DNA just like our cellular double-stranded DNA. Okay, so asymmetrical viruses, uh, if you cut this virus in half, the top is going to be different than the bottom, so that's kind of the message there is, is that um, uh, many viruses are, are not symmetrical. However, some are. I guess if you, if you cut this longitudinally, perhaps uh, you could say that it's symmetric unless it has an odd pair of, of, uh, of tail fibers. Okay, filamentous viruses. So, so this is actually the capsid, this long structure here, is actually, this says tail fiber here, but, but these, are, these are long uh, capsids here, and within this capsid is a circular piece of RNA. Okay, so it's kind of like a long oval RNA inside this long capsid. 
And the thing that, about filamentous viruses that's interesting is they can, depending on the length of the genome, they can package larger and larger. I mean, the capsid just gets, keeps getting bigger and bigger depending on how big the genome is. So that's kind of a neat feature of that particular virus. Okay, as we mentioned, viral genomes can be either DNA or RNA, okay? Sometimes double-stranded DNA, sometimes single-stranded DNA or RNA. Uh, they can be positive sense or negative sense. Uh, negative sense can also be called anti-sense. So if you start translating from a positive sense, that's just like a cellular RNA. So if a ribosome hops on to something that's, that's positive sense, it's going to start making viral proteins right away, okay? Just like if it were a cellular mRNA. It's going to start to make cellular proteins. If, it's, if a viral genome is negative sense, in order to make a, a positive sense so that it can start making capsid proteins, it has to actually make a positive sense. So, so it needs a polymerase to go from a negative sense to a positive sense. And usually these viruses that are negative sense have carry along with them an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Okay. Or perhaps a DNA-dependent uh, RNA polymerase if the virus is uh, negative sense single-stranded DNA. So the genomes can be linear or circular. Uh, they can include, uh, and then the, the genomes of course include the instructions for making capsid proteins, the instructions for making uh, envelope proteins if the virus is enveloped, and if the virus doesn't carry its own polymerase, then it has the instructions the DNA or RNA instructions for making a polymerase because many viruses have to make their own viral polymerase. They can't use the host cell polymerase. Okay, so now we'll talk about classification of viruses. Uh, every once in a while this special committee, International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses, uh, uh, gets together and they talk about new viruses that were discovered, and yes, we're still discovering new viruses. <clears throat> uh, and they base their uh, classification on genome composition primarily, and then capsids, envelopes, size, and then host range. But really, in this course, this is a picture from your book, in this course what we're going to be using is we're going to be using the kind of uh, Baltimore virus classification. David Baltimore is a Nobel Prize winning scientist here that actually discovered reverse transcriptase uh, and, and, uh, in retroviruses. And the reason we're going to be using this classification is it just it helps make sense. It m makes much better sense. So we're going to start out with a central mRNA or positive sense viral transcript. And the reason we're going to start out with this positive sense transcript of this mRNA is this is all viruses need to get to mRNA because they need to make viral proteins, okay? So since viruses come in and they hijack or subvert the cellular machinery, they take the host cell ribosomes and they make proteins from, from the, the viral mRNA using host cell ribosomes. So viral mRNA, which has to be positive sense in order to make a protein, otherwise you'll make a backwards protein if it's negative sense RNA, uh, with host cell uh, ribosomes. So let's see, we'll start out with, uh, with group one. So group one are double-stranded DNA viruses. An example here are herpes viruses or papillomaviruses. Uh, group two are single-stranded DNA virus. An example here might be uh, parvovirus. Okay, so some, sometimes you get your dog, hopefully all of you will get your dogs immunized against uh, parvovirus because it's a problem in dogs and, and people get parvovirus too, but a different type of parvovirus. And group three is double-stranded RNA viruses. Some of these are, are real viruses that can cause uh, diarrhea in, in people. And then let's see, there's group four, 